Now take your Bibles and turn about midway through the scriptures to a brand new study today in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. It's right after the book of Proverbs. Psalms is midway through your Bible, right before the book of Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. In May of 1996, journalist John Krakauer was part of an expedition that reached the top of Mount Everest. Twelve of his companions were killed in the highly publicized descent, which he included in his chilling book entitled Into Thin Air. Now, he begins his account by describing the feelings on May 10th of 1996 as he reached the highest place on planet Earth. Here's what John wrote. Straddling the top of the world, one foot in China and the other in Nepal, I cleared the ice from my oxygen mask, hunched a shoulder against the wind, and stared absently down into the vastness of Tibet below. Now, I'd been fantasizing about this moment and the release of emotions that would accompany it for many months. But now that it was finally here, actually standing on the summit of Everest, I just couldn't summon the energy to care anymore. I snapped four quick photos, turned and headed down. Read my watch, 1.17 p.m. I spent, all told, less than five minutes on the top of the world. Starting this Sunday, we're going to study the journal of a man who spent 40 years straddling the top of the world. This man achieved the apex of success and accomplished what no other human being in the history of humanity has hoped to accomplish. This man reached the top of the planet intellectually, occupationally, experientially, and yes, even sexually. If someone asked, have you tried, his response would have been, been there, done that. <laughs> Everything this man experienced. But like Krakauer, it left him deeply disillusioned. For in all of his passionate pursuits, he had temporarily put God on the back burner of his life. And whenever that happens, you lose the luster and the joy and the meaning for life. His story is found in one of the most fascinating books of the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes, and it's on your lap today. It's taken from the Greek word ekklesia, kaleo to call, ek a preposition out. It means the called out ones. The uh, Hispanics have a word for the church. It's iglesia. They get iglesia from this word ekklesia. It's the New Testament word for church. And so, therefore, the book is spoken, as it were, to the congregation. It's a message to the church. Let's begin by looking at the introduction, and let's meet the messenger in verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. The author, David's son, Solomon. He was an illustrious man. His daddy left him with a massive estate. And the great thing is that David had fought all the bloody battles prior to Solomon's arrival to the king. Therefore, he had complete peace, complete joy, and the ability to do what no other king in history and no other president in America could ever do, and that is live a life free from national and international conflict. Everything was peaceful, therefore he could go into the experiments and joys of life. Now, initially, he started off well. 1 Kings 3, 5 said he sought God, seeking for great wisdom and insight from his Father in heaven. But 1 Kings 11 tells us, as time went on, Solomon began to slip. He toyed with false deities, which turned his heart away from God, and he entered into relationships with multiplied honeys, many, many, many women, as we will talk about even in the weeks to come. Now, this brought great glory to Solomon and great agony to God. 
For his life was steady, direct disobedience with the Lord's command given to Moses many hundreds of years prior to this date before Israel ever dreamed of having a king in Deuteronomy. Let's read the words that God spoke in the future when the nation wanted a king. Here's God's rules. Let's read it together. He shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Solomon did it both. He was the richest king, and he had more wives than any king has ever had, maybe in the history of humanity. Now, his story is what happens when you choose to pursue all the joys of life apart from a passionate relationship with the creator himself. It has been said that uh, in the morning of his life, he wrote the Song of Solomon, a prose of passionate romance for the husband and wife relationship. And then at the noontime of his life came Proverbs, a book of heavenly rules for earthly living on the main streets of life, which we're examining every other Thursday night in the Bible study I have at my house with the college group. But at the evening of his life, the sunset of his life, came the book that's on your lap today, Ecclesiastes. It's a regretful, respective look at the disillusionment of life. And we're going to see parts of joy as well, but there's a lot of sadness that is seen throughout the pages of Ecclesiastes. Now, he calls himself, as we saw in verse 1, the preacher. That's the word koheleth in the Hebrew. It means one who gathers and collects thoughts. That's what a preacher does. He gathers information to put his message together. Solomon says, what I'm going to be sharing with you are the thoughts and the insights from what I've read. So there's going to be a great education in the months to come for each of you. If you attend this series on Ecclesiastes, you will learn a lot about everything in life. He talks about every single subject imaginable in the 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. He gathers it all together, and he gives it to us. That's the messenger. Now we notice, secondly, the message, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanities. Now, this is a hard one, so think about it for a minute. Can you guess the repetitive word? <laughs> well, it's used. A bunch of times, actually it's found 38 times in 12 chapters, it's the Hebrew word havel. And havel, translated vanity, means to be empty, means to be futile, it's a vapor. Uh, a professor of mine, back in college, entitled it, Soap Bubbles, Soap Bubbles. All is soap bubbles. Now you think of those soap bubbles that kids follow after. And they're kind of fun because they're nice to look at. Until you touch a soap bubble, and what happens? It pops, and when it pops, it disappears. And the message of Ecclesiastes is every single thing you touch in life will disappear. Marriages disappear, children disappear from your home, jobs disappear, eventually your health disappears, and finally what happens? You disappear as well. And so it's the message of disappearance. It's the message of vanity. Now, when we think of vanity, we connect it with egotism. And vanity, of course, is always based on not truth, but it's based on an illusion. A woman came to a pastor and said, Pastor, I have to confess that when I talk to the Lord about my sins, the number one sin that I confess most of all is the sin of vanity. He said, how so? She said, every morning when I get up, I spend a half an hour looking at my reflection in the mirror. He said, my dear, that is not the sin of vanity. You are suffering from the sin of imagination. <laughs> vanity is imagination. Vanity is an illusion. And Solomon says much of life without God is an illusion, has no meaning or purpose. It's like your breath on a cold winter's day. Once it goes out, you can see it for a second and then it disappears. Now, the key to understanding the message is the meaning of a little phrase in verse 3. What 
Advantage does man have in all of his work, which is done where? Under the sun. Say that with me. Under the sun. A key phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's not life over the sun from God's perspective, which brings you joy and purpose and meaning in life. It's life under the sun from man's perspective. And perhaps you're thinking, well, then why are we studying this book? It sounds depressing. Well, let me give you three reasons. Number one, it's part of inspired scripture. If God put it in the Bible, he has something to teach us. Number two, it's incredibly intriguing. Say that with me. It's incredibly intriguing. You know, the Spirit of God had been speaking to me for the last six months. After you finish James, I want you to go to Ecclesiastes. And I have resisted him because I've never in 41 years preached to this book. Because having read through the book, I thought it was too depressing. But I said, okay, God, I will yield to you. I will preach through Ecclesiastes. And I woke up at 3 o'clock on a morning, just could not go back to sleep. I can't do it, God. I can't preach through Ecclesiastes. It's going to be a downer. I don't know what to do. And finally, I drifted off to sleep, and I said, Lord, if you want me to go there, I will preach through this book. And so the next morning, I got up, and I began to read through everything I could get my hands on on the book of Ecclesiastes, and I read, and I wrote, and I read, and I wrote, and by the time I left that office that day at 5 o'clock, my heart was sore. And I have been studying and writing messages on the book of Ecclesiastes for the past three months. I have been consumed with this book because it's like candy to a kid who's never had it before. It is absolutely intriguing. God has some great lessons for us to learn in Ecclesiastes. And the third reason that we look at this book is because it is remarkably relevant. This may be the most relevant book out of all the 66 books of the Bible. Listen to some of the topics that he will tackle in Ecclesiastes. Injustice to the poor, chapter 4. Crooked politics, chapter 5. Are we dealing with that today? A desire for the good old days. We're going to preach about that. Oh, boy. I wish life was like it used to be. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, he will also talk about guilty people being permitted to commit more crimes, chapter 8. Sound relevant? And how about this one, chapter 10? Incompetent political leaders. I mean, come on. The timing is unbelievable. In fact, do you know I've timed it out? The message right before, the message directly before the national election, which is going to determine who will be our president this next year, days before that, I'll be speaking in a passage in Ecclesiastes that talks about how we treat those in leadership. It's amazing how God has put this together. I can't wait to share these insights with you. This is so up to date. What we read in Ecclesiastes is what you hear on the soap operas, is what you definitely are hearing in political speeches today. You're hearing it in the halls of academia and on the streets of any city. It's despair, it's despondency, it's disillusionment. Back in the 70s, it was called existentialism. And then it took a back seat for years, but now it's returned to the college campus again today. We've had so many experiences. We are filled with every single tidbit of knowledge that we could gain our hands on by pushing a button or a couple little levers on what we call the computer that we have everything in life, and we are bored with life. That's the message of Ecclesiastes. One professor wrote, in a school I visited, a student had inscribed on the hallway wall these words, tomorrow will be canceled due to a lack of interest. <laughs> Does that sound like today? That's Solomon. I have seen it all. I've experienced it all. And Solomon said, I'm bored with it all. What is he bored with? First of all, he is bored with the redundancy of nature. You could write that down. He is bored with the redundancy of nature, verse 4. Generation goes, generation comes. The earth remains forever. The earth stays, you and I don't. 
as I've scanned just the past few years in which we've been in this building, I've thought of the people that I have buried. Do you remember those people? Don Eggleston, Meg Brazil, Jordan Abronco, Jim Matheny, Bob Wallace, Ray Alvarez, Helen Lynch, Wanda Kaikendall, my mom, Lou Garcia. If you were close to them, they hold a special spot in your heart. But if you're going to be honest with Solomon and honest with Pastor Rick, honestly, you haven't thought about those people in a long time. When people die, I'm amazed at this. I, I deal, I traffic in, the, in the, the, the life of death. And people are thought about. Everybody is consumed with all the information that goes into the, the preparation of the eulogy. And everyone shows up in the dozens and the hundreds sometimes. This place has been packed out with 300 people at a funeral. And then no one talks about that person again. This is life. This is what Solomon is addressing. Men went to a rabbi for counseling. Listen to this. Two weeks ago, he said, for the first time in my life, I went to the funeral of a man my own age. I didn't know him well. We worked together. We talked from time to time. He had kids the same age as my kids. He died over the weekend. It could have easily have been me. That was two weeks ago. They've already replaced him at the office. His wife is moving out of state to live with her parents. Two weeks ago, he was living 50 feet away from me. Now it's as if he never existed. His life was like a rock falling into a pond of water. The water is the same as it was before, and the rock isn't there anymore. May 2nd, I went to the checkout line at Rouse. Two popular magazines had huge full page pictures and underneath a caption. Prince, musical genius, dead. Big news, May the 2nd, not news, August 7th. Because Prince has gone the way of Robin Williams, Michael Landon, Michael Jackson, David Bowie, When's the last time, honestly, honestly, those names graced your lips? Here's what I find fascinating. Every single year, the media makes sure that we remember JFK, Elvis Presley, and of all the people, Adolf Hitler. Turn on Netflix. Those films are always popping up. Three out of millions that die and are forgotten. That's what Solomon is saying here. The wisest man who ever lived, remember. Generation goes, generation comes. That's the second aspect of life. This last year, we've seen the births of Aliyah Leilani, Noah Juarez, Max Dressendorfer, Isaac Relator, Alyssa Brown, Alice Rose. This is life. They're buried, they're born. They're buried, they're born. They're buried, they're born. They're buried, they're born. That's it. And those who were born will be buried as well. And Solomon said, I've been watching it for a long time, and to me, it seems redundant. Verse 5. Also, the sun rises and the sun sets. Hastening to its place, it rises again. There's the sun rising in the east. Wait a few hours. There's the sun setting in the west. Then it scurries around to the opposite side of the earth while you're sleeping. Pops up again. How often does that happen? 
every day, every week, every month, every year, every decade, every century, every millennium. It just keeps happening again and again and again and again. And Solomon says there's a redundancy in it, but it cannot be stopped. Time can't be stopped. And yet there's death all throughout it. Douglas Caffey posted this poem on the website of the International War Veterans Poetry Archives. The morning wears a fresh white rose, gleaming white on white from head to toes. At noonday, the rose begins to wilt, showing splotches of patchwork quilt. At evening tide, the rose is dead. Now it lies in a silent bed. By my bride, a beautiful bouquet of roses. They look so lovely. Just give them a few days. They've already began dying the moment they were cut from the vine. So it will be for you and me. You say, that sounds disconcerting. It will be disconcerting if you as a Christian, and I would say at least half the Christians probably are like this, are living life under the sun, not spending much time at all, maybe Sundays if they're lucky, thinking about God. And so this is how they see life. These are the things that cross the person's mind who's not walking close to Christ. They're not talking about it, but they're thinking this way. That's why they're engaging in all the worldly activities around them, trying to find satisfaction in something that will never meet the needs of the soul. And Solomon goes, listen to me, I tried it, it doesn't work. Life under the sun, verse 6. Then I think about the wind blowing to the south, turning to the north, swinging around. I, I had an experience like this a number of years ago. I think it was about 13 years ago. I remember a day I said, I'm going to spend the whole day surfing trestles and let's just see what happens. I arrived in the morning, there was no wind, that's great. About 8.30, the south wind came up. Oh, that's bad for surfing trusses. It blows right in the face of the waves. And then at about 11.30, it moved around to the west wind, a little bit better. Then at 1 o'clock, it swung around to the northwest wind, just a tiny bit better. And then at 3 p.m., it came to the east wind, which is the only wind in California good for surfing because it blows straight off the land into the faces. But here's the point. In less than eight hours, I saw the wind change directions, and move to every single point of the compass. Jesus said the Spirit of God in John chapter 3 is like the blowing of the wind. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, you cannot capture him. You cannot corral him. You cannot control him. You have to go with him. And when the Spirit of God blew the accountability brothers into our church, we saw that movement. We didn't resist the movement. We flow with it. Whatever God is doing, you've got to flow with the wind because you don't know where the wind's going to blow next. You recall this pop song from 1977? Same old song, just a drop of water in an endless sea. All we do crumbles to the ground, although we refuse to see. Don't hang on. Nothing lasts forever, but the earth and sky, it'll all slip away, and your money will not another minute buy. And then the chorus, dust in the wind, all we are is dust in the wind. That's what Solomon said. Verse 7. Look at the rivers. They flow into the sea. The sea's not full. The place where the rivers flow again. Solomon describes the Earth's hydraulic cycle. Did you know that 97% of all the water on planet Earth exists in the oceans and the seas? You've been thinking it exists above me because I've been feeling it. And all this humidity. But do you know in all the humidity you feel, 0.0001% is in the atmosphere. That's all. Most of it in the ocean. 
Now, there is the hydraulic cycle in which the water keeps circulating. It goes to the top. It comes to the bottom. It goes to the top. It keeps moving. The rivers keep flowing. He said, but at all these little, little changes of the minute percentage, most of the water, like most of life, seems to stay the same. This is the redundancy in which he's speaking of. He sees it as a picture of the redundant life of the non-Christian and the Christian who won't put God first in their life, and therefore nothing makes them happy. And I want to tell you something today. If you're dissatisfied, if you're depressed, if you're struggling, if you're not thrilled with life, and I get that way, it's because God's not first in your life. I was talking to him about that in the way to come to church today, is that every time I get in the car, I use that as a time for prayer between me and the Lord. People go, if you listen to the song, if you listen to the song, I don't have time for songs. I only have time for prayer. Amen. And when I'm in the car, I'm talking to God. That's just my choice. I'm not saying you can't, you don't have to do that. I'm saying this is a great time for me and God to connect. And when I talk to the Lord about life, and when I think about the things that bother me and take away my satisfaction, and I have just about three or four things. I don't need much in life. But when I'm missing one of those four things, I'm sad, and I'm thinking, why am I sad? And God said, it's because you're trying to find satisfaction under the sun, Pastor Rick. Not with the sun. William Moulton Martin did a survey in which he interviewed 3,000 individuals. And he asked the question, what do you have to live for? He discovered 94%. You hear that? 94% weren't living at all. They're just waiting. Waiting for children to grow up and leave the house. Waiting for the next job or the next promotion. Waiting when things will be better, or at least different. Waiting for the chance to take a trip. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Life had degenerated not into living, but into waiting. Now listen, you and I are waiting. We are waiting for what Titus chapter 2 and 13 calls our happy hope. It's the sudden and spectacular arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we don't wait like the rest of the world because in that waiting room experience, we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9, God infuses you with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's waiting for the person who is waiting for something above the sun. And so when you're missing the joy, get above the sun, not under the sun. If your wife, if your kids, if your relatives, if your friends, if your church member is down, they're living life under the sun. Tell them to get above it, to get with Christ. And I'll bet, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet 60 or 70% of Christians live most of their life under the sun. This book hopefully will help you to get out from underneath that. That's the design by the Spirit of God. We don't have to be stuck in a sad sack state of Solomon. Amen? Amen. Verse 8, all things are wearisome. Man's not able to tell it. My eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear with hearing. What does that mean? Got to get something new, 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 new. That's my daughter. My daughter, Carla, she turned 39 this year, went down to do her wedding in Mexico to a wonderful man named Richard. They love each other, and they had the same personalities. They're moving and checking new things out all the time. When Carla was 12 years old, I said, honey, what do you want to do when you get older? She goes, dad, I want to move to Europe and be kidnapped by the gypsies. I just want to see the world, and that's all Carla does is see the world. She said that last year, out of 365 days, Richard and I spent 300 days of that in the air. She has traveled this planet 
everywhere on the planet again and again and again because she has a passion for new things. New cultures, new customs, new countries. And maybe you don't travel like that, but I see that with people. It's amazing. I talk with older people, people who look like they're about ready to die, others who aren't dead, but I think they are dead. They're just barely moving, you know. <laughs> and all I've got to do is mention something in the news. Whoa, the news. They perk right up. They take the oxygen mask and throw it off. Now they want to talk about it. You know? <laughs> people are really excited about the news. What's the new thing of the news? What's the new piece of gossip? What is the internet or Newsweek or Time Magazine or the television going to tell me today about the news? We are just addicted to new information. Something about a Hollywood star, something about a political personality, something new. Well, look at verse 9 to 11. That which has been always will be. That which has been done that which will be done. There is, there it is, nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it's new. It's existed for ages, which were before us. There's no remembrance of earlier things. Also the latter things which will be done. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. The great preacher of yesteryear, Harry Ironside of Moody Memorial Church in the 30s used to make this statement. If it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. This is why I stand as a skeptic, and most of you know this, just so much of the inventions and the twittering and the tweeting and all the addictions that people have today. I'm thinking, just give it a few years. It'll pass. It'll pass. Because it's just like this. It's not something new. It's a gadget that catches our interest, and it's a soap bubble that gets popped. Man can't create anything. He's the creature, not the creator. Thomas Alva Edison, in the opening years of the last century, was the greatest inventor that we'd ever seen. And here's what he said about his multiple inventions. All my inventions are simply bringing out the secrets of nature that God put there and applying them from the happiness of mankind. It's always been there. I'm just figuring out what was there. And Solomon said, I've been spending a lifetime figuring it out, and I'm bored with it. I'm bored with the redundancy of nature, and secondly, and college students will like this one, I'm bored with the futility of knowledge. The futility of knowledge. Verses 12 to 13. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I set my hand to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that's been done under the sun. It's a grievous task which God has given to the sons of man to be afflicted with. <laughs> Exploring the Hebrew is to investigate the roots of a matter. It's to examine an issue from all sides. That's what Pastor David and I do every time we put together a message. We get into the research. We want to know the culture and the language and the background and everything we possibly can about that passage. So all these thoughts are flowing around in our heads as we begin to write and the Spirit of God takes those thoughts along with our experiences, our knowledges, our insight, and weaves them together into a sermon that you have the privilege of hearing every Sunday morning. It's called research. Say that with me, research. And it involves work. That word makes some of you shake when you think about high school and college. Research papers. A few in our church have written a doctoral thesis. Hundreds of pages. Solomon goes, I've been writing, I've been researching, and studying frustrates me. Study is an affliction, and I shout a quick amen to Solomon just to show you God's great sense of humor in my life where I was the brunt of God's joke every week. I went through 10 years outside of high school for my education. A bachelor's degree and a master's degree. For 10 years, I did some basic background study on every teacher I was about to take. And I had one question. 
will they demand a research paper for this class? <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. Are they boring? I don't care. Are they interesting? I don't care. I want to know anything. Do you demand a research paper? Give me quizzes. Give me tests. Give me memorization. Give me reading. Please, please don't give me a research paper. I hate research papers. God said, really, Rick? You're going to write a research paper and deliver one to the congregation every single Sunday for the rest of your life. <laughs> you won't even type it, man. You will write it by hand. And guess what? I love it now. That's God's sense of humor. Fantastic. Now, Solomon didn't think it was funny because he was the wisest man on the earth, and he wasn't happy with all of his knowledge. He had amassed far more than I've amassed, and he's going to be sharing it with us in the months to come. But he said, I find, I find it frustrating. I find it unfulfilling. In verse 13, he said, it's a grievous task, which means it wore him out. And when you're worn out, what do you do? You whine, like a little cheese with that whine. Yeah. Warren Wiersbe, who's written many fine commentators, a great pastor of yesteryear, still alive today, said, one evening I was sitting in my backyard, I heard a robin singing. Now listen to Warren's words. Since early dawn, that bird has been doing nothing but trying to survive. He's been wearing himself out, hiding from enemies, looking for food, caring for his little ones. And when it gets to the end of his day, what does he do? He sings. Here I am, created in the image of God, saved by the grace of God, and I complain about the smallest annoyances in my life. One day I'll be like Jesus, and for that reason alone, I should be singing God's praises every day like the robin. So start singing his praises. Every day there should be at least one song in your heart to the Savior. Amen. Don't be a sour apple like Solomon, verses 14 to 15. I've seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, it's vanity, it's striving after the wind. What is crooked can't be straightened. What is lacking can't be counted. Ken, Ken Taylor paraphrases it this way. What is wrong cannot be righted. It's water over the dam. You can't be thinking about it. You can't change it. But when the wisest of the wise walked this planet, he changed a lot of things. He did what Solomon never imagined could be done. He healed the lepers. He cured the sick. He cured the cripple. He cast out demons. He gave sight to the blind and hearing to those who could not hear. And he raised the dead. And he's the answer to Solomon's sadness and cry. He's the answer to your sadness today. Jesus could do the miracles. We have people in this congregation today who've been diagnosed with cancer this week. And that's not a fresh thing to Orange Coast Community Church. Because it was just last year we had five or six diagnosed with cancer. Guess what? They're still with us today and still kicking and doing better because the healer is at work. Amen? He could do the great things that Solomon thought no one could do. And he said in Luke 137, with God, and here's one for you to memorize, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Verses 16 to 18. I said to myself, behold, I magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem. Incidentally, the Bible says no one who's ever lived was wiser than Solomon. So you're going to get wisdom from this book. Before me, my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. We'll talk about that next week. I realize that this also is striving after the wind. Because in much wisdom, there's much grief. And increasing knowledge, increasing pain. Every high school and college student could shout what? Amen to that. You're in summertime, but pretty soon you're moving into school. And here comes school. Tests, homeworks, reading. Memorization, 
projects, papers. It's just a mountain unending. I went through it for 10 years out of high school. You say, yeah, but you graduated a long time ago. It doesn't make a difference. It still haunts me to this day. Do you know that I graduated from Talbot Seminary in 1980? It's been 36 years since I have graduated with a master's degree, and I still have two reoccurring nightmares. One, I'm supposed to graduate from college in two weeks. And someone from administration said, oh, you forgot to take a mandatory class in English. We're not going to let you graduate. And boy, I wake up in a cold sweat. Two, I'm 64 years old. I wake up on a Wednesday morning. I say, Christine, I'm going surfing. She said, you can't go surfing. You have to take a class at Biola. Oh. I said, Ah, uh, you talk about the twilight zone. <laughs> Were you even born when I went to a biology? <laughs> Biola? I said, I graduated from Talbot in 1980 with a master's degree. I graduated from Biola in 1976 with a bachelor's degree. Biola, no, no, I don't want to go there. I'm going to go surfing. She goes, you can't. You have to go to Biola. I said, why would I go to Biola? She goes, you're working on a second bachelor's degree. And I shout, I don't want a second bachelor's degree. I want to go surfing. And I sit up and bread. <laughs> I am still haunted by the horrors of education. I hook into what Solomon is saying here. It's good to go to school. It's good to learn. It's good to stretch your mind. It's good to stretch your imagination. But listen, your school won't satisfy the longings of your soul. That's from one who's been there. That's why you've got to be here every Sunday. And that's why when I hear these kids high school going to college, I pray for one thing. Lord, don't let them leave this church. <laughs> Unless they leave and hook up with a good church, and oftentimes that doesn't happen. This is where you're going to get the satisfaction for your soul, just because we will tell you who to turn to. Education doesn't meet the needs. Listen to our politicians. I heard one just the other day saying, what, I heard it coming back from surfing yesterday morning. The president's wife. What you got, you got to be doing, you got to be studying during, during the summertime because if you're not studying in the summertime, you, you're not going to have, a, you're going to, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> We're worshiping education today. And the education that is out there, and you could quote this, much of it is crap. No, no, it's worse than crap. Because crap means nothing. This stuff is destructive and devastating. I know what's being taught on those campuses. And I pray for those of you that you stay strong and you walk with the Savior. Because everything in the college campus today, the secular campus, will try to pull you away. Pull you away from the truths that you're being taught here every Sunday. Education doesn't satisfy the soul. It twists it. Karen Chang was a very interesting person. At the age of 17 from Fremont, California, she achieved a perfect 800 on both sections of the SAT. Then got a perfect 8,000 on the rigorous University of California acceptance index. Here's what's interesting. No one in the history of humanity has ever accomplished what she accomplished. Beyond brilliant. They asked Karen to describe herself. Here's what she said. I'm just a typical teen. I'm much on junk food. I talk for hours on the phone. And I'm a procrastinator. I don't do my homework to the last minute. And her teacher said, that's not true. It's not true. They called Karen Wonder Woman because of her quest for knowledge and her uncanny ability to memorize everything she read. Miracle girl. And so with all this knowledge, and all this wisdom, all this insight at the age of 17, they swarmed around her and they asked the question, Karen, what is the meaning to life? She said, the meaning to life? I have no idea. I'd like to know myself. T.S. Eliot put it this way. All of our knowledge 
has one goal and one alone, to bring us closer to our profound sense of ignorance. Josh McDowell, who graduated from my alma mater and has spoken all over the United States and the world when it comes to being a defender of Christianity, spoke on every college campus imaginable. And here's what he has told students for dozens and dozens and dozens of years. Listen. If education is the key to life, universities would be the most moral, ethical, and spiritual centers on the planet. Is that what they're known for today? They're the most debased, debased, debauched, depressed, and disillusioned places on the planet today. What are universities known for? You ready? They're known for date rapes. That comes from universities. They're known for wild, crazed, psychotic sexual expressions. They are known for political activism that's not even based on a person's mind, but just based purely on emotions. They're known for flagrant substance abuse, alcohol and drugs. And they're known for rising, rising suicide rates. That's college today. Solomon was right, wasn't he? Solomon was inspired by the Spirit of God when he wrote these words. Solomon is telling us today that education, apart from God, will leave a huge gaping hole in your soul. So we're left with two lingering lessons. Lesson number one. You won't be satisfied under the sun. A good portion of our church does not believe that. Because as I speak to you today, they're chasing something under the sun. People that I pray for, people that I know, people that I care for, people that I love, have time for everything except an intimate walk with God. And they are Christians, but they're trying to find satisfaction somewhere than the sun. A world, that they don't even try. They engage in everything but the sun. And Solomon goes, I've tried it. Listen to me. I know it doesn't work. A lust for knowledge, a love for nature, for power, for pleasure, for popularity, for sexuality, for prestige. It will always leave you feeling empty. I counsel with people who are Christians who are, are putting their relationship with God aside so they could explore areas of sexuality and explore areas of alcohol and drugs. And I ask them as they come into me crying and tears and destroyed by life, why do you think you are so sad? Why do you think you two fight all the time? Why do you think there's aggravation? Because you are looking for life under the sun. And until you leave that and put Jesus first, you will struggle until the day you die. Let it go. Let it go. That's why we study the book of Ecclesiastes. You say, why has it gotten worse today? We didn't hear about flagrant substance abuse. We didn't hear about rising suicide rates. We didn't hear about date rapes in the early 60s. I'll tell you why it's gotten worse. And I'll tell you not from the Bible. I'll tell you from Time Magazine. Some of you might remember April 8th, 1966, when Time Magazine splashed across its pages a three-letter question or three-word question, is God dead? People who are alive never forgot that. Shocked the world. But it's interesting, that question came out of a study that was done one year prior in 1965 when they discovered 97% of Americans believed in a creator God. Flash forward to 2014. Pew Research two years ago did its study discovering now 64 percent of Americans 
even believe in a God. That's why they're disillusioned. That's why they're disenfranchised. That's why they're depressed. And that answers the question why people, for no reasons, we're not talking about terrorism, we'll talk about that in another message. We're just talking about average people are pulling out pistols and pulling out guns and blowing people away. It is stupid. It is stupid. It is asinine. But because these people are so dissatisfied with life and they won't choose the Savior. What is it going to take for the world to get it? What is it going to take for some Christians, even in Orange Coast, to get it? And I hope some of the angst that I'm feeling will come into your heart and that you will go to some of these people who are in this church and you will shake them and say, get it. Get back to the Savior. Get back to church. Be there every week. Get on your knees. Be in the Bible. God will satisfy you. Everything you do outside of God will never satisfy. There's your Koheleth. There's your preacher. That's the bad news. Here's some good news. <laughs> you will be satisfied with the son. Say that with me. You will be satisfied with the son. I mean, that's why he arrived in the spinning globe. He so said, didn't he arrive to satisfy issues between the anger between the father and me? Oh, yes. Didn't he arrive to, to silence my sin? Yes. Didn't he arrive to offer me the Father's forgiveness? Yes, 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 yes. But Jesus also tells us his prime reason for arrival in my all-time favorite verse. You know it, John 10, 10, say it with me. I have come that they might have life and might have it more abundantly. That's what the world wants. That's where they're shooting. That's where they're snorting. That's where they're dropping their clothes. That's where they're doing everything in the world. They want abundant life. And if you're searching for abundant life today outside of Christ, I'm hoping that before you leave this place, you will rededicate your life to Jesus Christ and say, satisfy my soul. And Jesus will answer that because that's why he came to the spinning globe. Abundant life. Our English word abundant comes from the two Latin terms, ab undere. And ab undere refers to the rising in the waves. I like that, for obvious reasons. <laughs> it speaks of the water and the coastline being swamped as the tide increases and the swell increases. That's abundance. It just overwhelms. Now, the original term that Jesus used Parisos is a mathematical term for abundance. And you might interest, find it interesting that it's used by Matthew in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 20 to refer to catch this, the 12 baskets of food left over when Jesus had fed over five to 10,000 people. Yeah. So here's what he offers. More than you will ever need. You're saying, I don't feel it today. That's because you're not going to the Savior. That's because you're trying to fill your life with something other than the Lord. And you're thinking, if I get that job, if I get that promotion, if I get that marriage, if my mate would come back to me, you're thinking something today, and it's not going to happen, and you won't be satisfied until the Savior is number one in your life. Because his promise is, ab under. His promise is parisas. Recently, I counseled with a couple, getting ready to get married. The husband-to-be was very, very successful in a very sordid life of sin. And he told me about all that he accomplished in life. And I asked him, do you think you ever return to that? He laughed. Are you kidding, he said. Let me tell you what I have in Jesus. And begin to spell out one item after another. I could never go back to that lifestyle. I have everything I've ever dreamed and asked for today. That's abundere. That's parisas. That's the abundant life. And that's what God has for you today. It's like the constant surging surf. It overflows your heart. And when it overflows your heart, it has to go somewhere. Where does it go? It goes into your family. It goes into your friends. It goes into your coworkers. It goes into the person that you see on the freeway. Everyone gets flooded by the joy and the happiness and the meaning and the purpose of your life. 
you end up with a surplus of satisfaction, a deluge of delight. Ask Blaise Pascal. I think he was the most brilliant mind that ever came from France. A thinker, a scientist, a mathematician, an inventor. As a boy, Blaise's grasp of mathematics led to the involvement with the Academy of Sciences as a preteen. When I'm struggling writing a five-page paper, Blez is writing books on theorems of mathematics at, at 15. Books that made his professor's heads swim because he was so brilliant. When he was 16, he invented history, history's first digital calculating machine. I thank God for Blez. I am horrible with mathematics. I depend on a calculator for everything. You got to pack a calculator? You have one in your iPhone, you thank Blaise Pascal at 16 for that. Blaise Pascal also invented the barometer, the vacuum pump, the air compressor, the syringe, and the hydraulic press as a teenager. Could you imagine what that did for his success? He went straight to the top, just like Solomon. He had everything life could offer, all the wine, all the women, all the song, Everything that some of you are thinking, I wish, I wish, I wish. He goes, I had it, been there, done that. But as a young man, he became deeply disillusioned with the spiritual equation of life, and he realized that nothing that Paris had to offer him would satisfy the longings of his soul. Just like John Krakauer straddling the top of the world, just like King Solomon, nothing sizzles. Nothing satisfies. Where do I go? One night in despair, he just happened to crack open the Bible. And it fell open to John 17. And he said the words of verse 3 sparked from the page and set the whole room on fire. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And he said, instantly, my soul took wing. Instantly, I was in the permanent embrace of Jesus. And he picked up a pen, and he picked up a parchment, and he began to write as fast as he could. And here's what he wrote. In the year of grace, isn't that nice? I like that. In the year of grace, 1654. Monday, 23rd of November, fire. Jacob, not God of the philosophers and scholars. Certitude, certitude, feelings of joy and peace. Actually, joy, 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 tears of joy. Here's eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. Oh, Jesus, never let me be separated from you. And Blez spent the rest of his life proclaiming the greatness of God to all who would hear. And that little piece of paper that he wrote on was found after his death, sewn into the lining of his favorite and most expensive coat to always be close to his heart. Who? Or what are you trying to fill your life with today? Let's bow together. Pascal said there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every person. It could not be fulfilled by any created thing. What are you trying to fill your life with? God said, I love you, but you won't be satisfied until you come to my son. Maybe you've never fully made a decision for Jesus Christ. Maybe he does not represent the secret of your soul today. Maybe he's not the reason for your existence and for every breath you take. 
but you want him to be. And so here is a non-Christian. You're saying, I want to give my life fully to Jesus for the first time today. Pastor, pray for me that I will have this satisfaction that will cause me to look nowhere else. If that's your heart's desire, then just raise your head and look at me in the eyes, and I will pray with you today. You're a Christian. Christ is not the center and circumference of your life. I don't know if that's true, but you know it's true. And that's why you're trying to fill it with something. Jesus said, please fill it with me this morning. You're saying, Pastor, would you pray? Would you pray that I will sense the filling and the presence of Christ in my life today? I need that desperately. If that's where your heart's at, then just raise your hand good and high, and I will pray for you right now. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Yes, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, honey. I want to thank you, Father, for the four who raised their hands today. I don't know the struggles of their hearts. I only know the struggle of mine. I know I'm just like them. I know that sometimes I preach these truths and I hear these truths and I study them, but, but they're not the, the essence of my being, and that's what you want from me and from these people today. Right now, infuse them with the joy unspeakable and full of glory. Give them the certitude that Blaise Pascal had. Give them the reassurance that Jesus promised in John 10.10. 10. And as they step out of this place and step into a world that is confused and conflicted and confounded, let them say, I could communicate the truth. I know the Christ who meets the needs of life. Strengthen their souls. Encourage their hearts. Draw them every day to time and prayer, time in your word, and let them see the difference this one week could make of being totally sold out to you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name.